videography and television broadcasting, and he also served as president of the Drake State Cybersecurity Club. Kirk was also selected as a Thurgood Marshall College Fund Leadership Institute Scholar. Kirk has been a 4.0 presidential scholar student throughout his tenure at Drake State. He recently started his new position, so he graduated in December 19, and he's already working, our graduate work, at the Cook Museum in Decatur, Alabama. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Mr. Kirk Salmon. I would like to uh, thank uh, Chairman Thompson and Chancellor Baker, the board members, and uh, Dr. Patricia Sims, and our CIS division chair instructor, Dr. Dolores Smothers, for inviting me to address you today. Um, I'd also like to thank my wife for allowing me to come. Uh, leaving her home with four children is always a, uh, a big ask. Um, earning my associate's degree in computer information systems at Drake State has been a life-changing experience. Uh, over a, in a little over two years ago, uh, at the age of 36, I found myself working in a job that I loved, uh, but with very little opportunity for advancement. Uh, it was something that I had fallen into as I traveled along the road of life, um, and, but financially it had become a trap rather than a blessing. Um, my wife, um, very thankful for her, saw my potential more clearly than I did. And uh, she began to encourage me to make a career change. Um, knowing the challenges that the job market would present, uh, we agreed that I could that I would uh, earn my associate's degree first, but under two conditions. I had to continue working full time while going to school, and we couldn't go into debt to pay for my school. I chose Drake State because it was affordable. It offered smaller class sizes, had a good record of graduates who found jobs in the area, and uh, it offered online courses and a class schedule that was flexible enough to allow me to continue working while I was attending. During the application and registration process, I was encouraged to apply for and was awarded the Institutional Academic Scholarship, which I maintained throughout my time at Drake State. With that and other grants and scholarships, I was able to complete my associate's degree without going into debt. The coursework at Drake State um, prepared me for the certifications that I needed in the computer information industry. I've already taken and passed my A plus and security plus certifications, and I'll be taking my network plus certification in the next few weeks, which will be paid for through a scholarship offered by a local business. Um, an opportunity that, that Drake State helped to um, facilitate for their students. Uh, this past fall, I also received a scholarship from Apple to travel to Washington, D.C. for three days to attend the Thurgood Marshall College Funds Leadership Institute. I don't have the time now to do justice to what I was able to gain from that experience. The skills I learned helped me in my job search and will continue to assist me in a variety of ways as I navigate the corporate landscape as both a leader and an employee. I'm happy to tell you that my time at Drake State, as Ms. Dr. Sims mentioned, has paid off in a very tangible way. Uh, the day after my last class, I accepted the position as the system administrator for the Cook Museum of Natural Science in Decatur. Without my time at Drake State, I would not have had the skills knowledge or courage to apply for or receive such a wonderful career placement. I'm very grateful to the staff and faculty of Drake State for their patience, knowledge, and support through my academic journey. They have been an important part in the advancement of my career and the quality of life that I'm able to provide for my family as I move forward. I'm proud of my school and the college system of Alabama as they continue to train students for the workforce and offer them an opportunity for a better life. that would be uh, we will have uh, at each 
forward to hearing more success stories like that from so many students across the state. At this time, we'll go to item eight, academic and student affairs, adult education, facilities, physical, information technology, and workforce development action items. Item eight, day one, division place for the city of Gadsden, for Gadsden State Community College, which was on the work session last month. We'll have some briefs. Thoroughly briefed on this. We've had an opportunity to ask questions. At this time, I'm going to take a motion. Motion by Mr. Woods.
across the state, there's been some great savings. It's well worth any other comments. Seeing that we move to vote, all those in favor of approving the bond refinance for all the state community college chancellors in the time of the motion carries. On paint A6, resubmittal of a recommendation for well being center and business even at the Florida State Community College Council. At this time, I want to make a motion. Here's a good second by Ms. Brown. Any discussion? Seeing none, we move to a vote. All those in favor of approving this. The well being center and business even better at the Florida State Community College.
Talent Search Coordinator from 1979 to 1981, Coordinator of Evening Programs from 1981 to 1982, Technical Industrial Internship and Co-op Program Coordinator from 1982 to 1983, Program Instructor, CETA Summer Youth Program in 1983, Veterans Affairs Director and Assistant Financial Aid Director from 1983 to 1988, Instructor of Related English and Psychology, 1989, Coordinator of Student Services from 1990 to 1995, Title III B Activity 5 Director from 2001 to 2007, and Dean of Student Services from 1995 to 2007, and finally Interim President in 2007. Whereas Mr. Mullen has served as president from 2007 to present, serving as the chief administrative officer of the college in direct reporting relationship to the chancellor of the Alabama Community College System. And whereas Mr. Mullen has provided exemplary leadership in guiding Trenton State to the acquisition of SAC COC accreditation, thus opening the door to becoming a community college. Mr. Mullen's other accomplishments include enrollment has increased by an all time high of 53% from 1,338 students in 2014 to 2,050 students in fall of 2019. The retention rate has risen from 37% to 61%. New programs have been established to include diagnostic medical sonography, medical radiologic technology, respiratory therapy, registered nursing, cybersecurity, advanced manufacturing, and business administration. The college was awarded a grant totaling $496,451 from the United States Department of Agriculture to create the South Central Alabama Distance Learning Network and a $419,161 grant awarded by the Alabama Department of Commerce to create a Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Occupational Skills Training Program. Buildings have been renovated on the Trenton campus at a cost of approximately $12 million, and Patterson site renovations at approximately $15 million, including renovated facilities, improving infrastructure, and constructing the Automotive Manufacturing Center. The Culinary Arts Program was moved to downtown Montgomery, given the college a downtown presence. A seven-acre truck driving track was added to increase truck driving graduates from 76 to 106. Transfer relationships were established with Troy University Montgomery, Auburn University Montgomery, Walker University, Alabama State University, University of West Alabama, and Huntington College. A pedestrian bridge was constructed connecting the library to the main campus. A legacy garden was constructed on the campus. The Workforce Development Division increased offerings. The Upward Bound Program received funding and an instructional site was established in Macon County. And whereas Mr. Munlin served the Alabama Community College System as past president and treasurer of the Alabama Community College System Presidents Association and the Alabama Dean of Student Affairs Association. And whereas Mr. Munlin has served in several professional organizations to include the American Association, American Association of Minority Veteran Program Administrators, Vice Chairman, Alabama Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admission Officers, National Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Education, Alabama Skills USA, National Coalition of Advanced Technology Centers, Alabama Association of Montgomery County Department of Human Resources Board, Job Corps Advisory Member, United Way, Family Guidance Center Board, Tuckabatchee Boy Scout Council, Tudor Step Program, at Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church, Substance Abuse Youth Networking Organization, Partners in Education, Leadership Montgomery, Leadership Alabama, Youth Leadership Montgomery, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, Montgomery Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, Montgomery Chamber of Commerce of 100, Montgomery Chamber of Commerce of 100 Board of Control, Jubilee Board of Directors, Region 5 Workforce Development Council, COC Education and Workforce Development Council, Capital City Club Board of Governors, Small Business Resource Center, Montgomery Metro YMCA Board, and Montgomery Area Business Committee for the Arts. Whereas Mr.
Mr. Mullen has received numerous achievement awards, including the Lake Lakin Institute presented by the President's Roundtable 2004 and Alabama Community College <coughs> Leadership Academy 2000-2001. Whereas Mr. Mullen has served as a, per, a presenter and guest speaker at the Alabama Deans of Students Association Learner International, Noel Levitt's Conference, the National Association of Veteran Program Administrators, the Alabama Veterans Affairs <coughs> Association, and the Louisiana Veteran Affairs Association. And whereas Mr. Mullen has exhibited strong support of student services for Truman State Community College by coordinating the Honors Day program, the Veterans Day program, Black History Celebration, coordination of Mr. <coughs> Mullen and Valentine's Ball, Counselor's Night Out, high, uh, SGA elections, Christmas feast, Tech Prep Day, Red Cross Blood Drive, annual Back to School Festival, faculty and staff awards programs, annual career day, parent orientation, student orientation, drug awareness program, instituted the adopt a school program, founder and organizer of the Trinum Tops, student ambassador, Alabama Skills Olympics, who's who's among students in American junior colleges, outstanding student awards, outstanding alumni awards, all academic team and student leadership institutes, <coughs> And whereas Mr. Mullen demonstrated a commitment to excellence, personal accountability, passion for community college education, unwavering support for students, respect for fellow employees, and servant leadership to Trinum State for 40 years. Now, th now therefore, be it resolved that the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees hereby recognizes and honors Mr. Sam Mullen for authorizing Trinum State Community College to confer on him the title of President Emeritus. Yet further resolved that the Board of Trustees extends its deep appreciation to Mr. Sam Mullen for his dedication and service to Trinum State Community College and the Alabama Community College Systems and Citizens of Alabama. Adopted by the Alabama Community College System Board of Trustees this 8th day of January, 2020. <coughs> Superintendent. 
Trinum had an enrollment of 998, I'm sorry, 698 students and tuition was $90 per quarter, not semester. Colleges also had buses running all over the state. Gas at that time was 86 cents a gallon. And you could buy a new car for a little more than $8,000. All my years at Trenum, there are two things that I require of people who I dealt with, and especially those who worked under my leadership. Number one, students first. We live and we die by what we do for students. And number two, treat everyone, everyone, vendors, students, teachers, staff people, even the maintenance people, you treat them all with dignity and respect. And I'm here to tell you, I've tried my best over the last 40 years to do just that. You know, when we became SACS accredited a few years ago, when we started that process, Dr. Claudette Williams was our representative. And I remember what she told us on that fateful day during that candidacy visit. She said, Y'all are young. You're drinking milk now. But I'm going to tell you, when I come back in a year, I want you to be weaned from that milk. And I want you to be eating solid food. <laughs> and you can tell by the accomplishments of our college that we did get weaned from the milk. And we're now eating that solid food. And I leave you today saying that, yes, Trenum is eating the solid food and our students will be the best for that. Thank you and God bless you all.
friends. I did.
and then also to talk about what's going on with the commission. Uh, there, be, until July 1st of 2020, there are three different types of accreditors. There are national accreditors, which were established um, probably 40, 50 years ago at the most to accommodate institutions that all had similar missions. Most specifically, those institutions that had online programs because we were not uh, accrediting institutions that were totally online at that particular point. Uh, and there were also some uh, subject areas like uh, chiropractic institutions and uh, you know lots of different specialties. And so they decided to start their own accrediting bodies. There were no geographic boundaries for those national accreditors. They could accredit institutions anywhere in the country. But again, their institutions had the same mission. Regional accreditors are much older. Uh, our commission, for example, has been around since 1895. Uh, we like to think we know what we're doing. We at least are still standing, and so are our institutions for the most part. Uh, but we do have geographic boundaries. Then there are programmatic or specialized accreditors that different institutions um, engage in their process so that their programs can have that extra oomph to them, if you will, and because many states are requiring that uh, folks who uh, get a teaching certificate, an engineering certificate, things like that, have a, a, a specialized accreditation. As of July 1st, we will not have national and regional accreditors anymore. Uh, the department has classified us now as institutional accreditors. So we have institutional accreditors and programmatic accreditors. And that sounds nice and simple. But what it does is it allows an institution to choose its institutional accreditor, irrespective of where they're located. Correction. It allows an institution to apply for membership with an, ins with an institutional accreditor, irrespective of where they're located. So someone from Ohio could apply for membership in the southern region. Not quite sure why they would, but other than we're the best. but. Um, we're also the most rigorous, according to folks around the country. Uh, it does not require, however, that the accreditors accept those um, applications from others. So it's, it's gonna, it could change our membership. I don't know how our board's going to respond to that. I was talking with staff uh, Monday when we got back off the holiday. Uh, because I lamented over the entire holiday country, how are we going to do this? Because our, our board, for example, is a 77-member board, and it's representative of people from the 11 states that have traditionally been in our region. Uh, if we suddenly start accepting applications from institutions outside of the region, what is that going to do to the board membership? Am I going to have an even larger board, or am I going to reduce the size of the board? I, so there are a lot of things that are involved in that. But right now, there are three types of accreditors. Um, the regional accreditors have three purposes, the first of which, since 1895, and continues to 2020, to be a, uh, improvement or quality assurance of the offerings that are there at the institution, that the buildings are of high quality, that the staff is of high quality, that the curriculum is of high quality, everything that is done, that the governance of the institution, you know, is of the highest quality, and, and that has always been our number one concern. Our second purpose, though, is to let the general public know that there is a rigorous process of review that institutions must undergo uh, for them to feel comfortable to attend and spend their money there. Uh, you know, that this is not a fly-by-night kind of organization. And it, it is a difference. Uh, you don't have to be accredited in order to exist as an institution. But there's no guarantee of the quality that you get of those institutions that don't undergo some kind of a rigorous uh, a review. Uh, the third purpose is to serve as the gatekeeper for federal financial aid with the federal government. We entered into a partnership in the 1950s with the Department of Education because they were trying to determine how to fund the GI Bill and where to send the money. And they decided that since the creditors had been in the field for a long time, and we understood and guaranteed that quality, that if an institution secured the accreditation uh, of an uh, accredited body, then they would allow them to avail themselves of federal financial aid. That's since the 1950s. Since then, the federal government is somehow thinking that they own us. And so there are things that they try to put in place and tell us that we have to do that we end up saying, Yo, dude, you can't tell me that. 
one of them is who my members can be. So we are kind of concerned about, you know, some of the changes that they're trying to make because we are a private, not-for-profit membership organization. And while we agree to um, partner with the federal government and we, you know, agree that there are standards that they want to ensure that our institutions follow, that we will monitor that, that we don't, they don't own us. And so there are folks in D.C. who know how I feel about that. <laughs> when you look at the uh, characteristics of regional accreditation, the process itself is a very comprehensive process. We look at everything from soup to nuts. And so we only do it once every 10 years because, you know, as Sam indicated, you know, going through candidacy and, and going from milk to solid food is a, a process. If you have any children, you understand what that process was like when they were trying to do that. Um, it is also, <clears throat> we have one set of standards that we use to evaluate the effectiveness of all 792 of our member institutions, including the 24 that are here in Alabama uh, with the community college system. The um, difference is we evaluate each institution based on its own mission. So we use the same set of standards for Auburn and the University of Alabama that we do for Trenum State. It's just that we look to see, based on what you say you're about, how effective are you at what you're doing? And so it's worked for us. Our members decide those standards. My staff does not sit up and dream up stuff. We could, on many occasions, be much more creative uh, than our standards. We could, you know, and, and yet our members have agreed that these are the things that we do. Um, we look at the purpose and the mission of an institution. Uh, as I indicated, currently we are regional in scope. I don't know if that's going to change. Uh, it is a voluntary process because, as I said, you do not have to be accredited in order to exist. We have institutions that we accredit that do not accept federal financial aid either, but they're still accredited because of that, that second purpose, as I told you, of letting the public know that they're worth the risk, as it were, because they had undergone the, the process. Uh, we are not a governmental entity. You all own us. So when the chancellor invites me, I say, sure, I'll be glad to come. You all pay my salary. I'll show up anytime you want to. I promise to bring a suitcase next time I come. <laughs> <laughs> we are a decentralized national system in that all of the regional accreditors do talk with each other regularly. We meet together in person three times a year. We have a bi-weekly phone call, and I'm sitting there looking at 17 emails that had come in from them since 7 o'clock this morning. Uh, because we talk to each other about what's going on, especially what's going on now during reauthorization of the Higher Act and stuff that's coming up in D.C. because what impacts one of us impacts all of us. And so we try to make sure that we present a united front when we go to, to Washington to, to let folks know. We talk about what's going on in each of our states because there are the things that uh, the state legislators talk to each other across state lines as well. One of the uh, examples of that, for example, is <clears throat> states are now beginning to mandate that institutions must have free ch open speech zones and they cannot charge extra for the security that may be necessary to, um, you know, to, to cover the event, as it were. That started with one state and has moved now to all but one of the states in our region has adopted that particular policy. So there are things that go on in different states. So we need to know, you know, what's happening in Massachusetts and, uh, you know, and tell them what's going on in Alabama. We are not for profit. Um, this is the current map of the regional creditors, and I do know that Alaska does not belong down by Southwest Texas, but it wouldn't fit on this slide if I hadn't put it down there. Uh, you can see by color what the regions look like. The red color for the southern region was not designed to be a political statement, though I guess it could very well be. It just was the color that we used to draw them on the map. But you can see that we go from Texas up to Virginia and Kentucky and everything south. Uh, when the commission first started back in the 1800s, uh, probably up until about 1930, both Arkansas and West Virginia were a part of our region. And the K-12 division, maybe you know the the story behind that, I haven't heard it all yet, uh, Mr. Newman, but the uh, K-12 division got upset about some policy changes that were going on, and so they decided to leave, and they went north to the Higher Learning Commission, and their colleges and universities joined them, and they've never asked to, to come back. So, that, is that all you know, too? That's all I know. Oh, well, we got to do better. we got to find out the skeletons there. That's driving me crazy. But you can see that the, the New England region uh, up in the top uh, represents the New England states, the middle states. And these, each of the regions were established by the institutions 
in that particular area. So when they talk about getting rid of regions, there are cultural differences, there are political differences, there are all kinds of differences that exist you know, among the different regions. And so for uh, University of Chicago, for example, to agree to some of our standards may not be realistic. Uh, so we're, we're looking at all kinds of things though. But California, it, it says here that there's six regional accrediting associations, but there's seven bodies because in the western region, which is represented in California, uh, Hawaii, and the Samoan Islands, which are those little pieces that are also down in South Texas area here on this map, um, they have two different accreditors, one who accredits just community colleges and one who accredits the senior institutions. So we, we and they have different presidents, different boards. So we talk about seven regional accreditors, even though there are only six associations because they're part of the same association. Um, as I mentioned, we are we talk to each other a lot. We have formed an organization we call CRAC, and we put that dash there intentionally because otherwise it'd be crack. And you know, people people don't always take us seriously anyway, and so we want to make sure they do. But that's the Council of Regional Accrediting Commissions, which is uh, me and my six counterparts and our board chairs. And we get together in person once a year just to, to keep the uh, board chairs collectively apprised of what's going on, you know, especially at the national level, and to get their input on, we're looking at these kinds of things, we're looking at pushing this in Washington, what do you think about it, how do you think your board, you know, would respond to it and stuff like that. So this meeting this year is coming up the first week of February, so it will be an interesting conversation in light of negotiated rulemaking. Bec uh, as the institutions have to go through an accreditation process, the accreditors also have to go through a recognition process. The federal government wants to make sure that we're still doing what we said we were going to do with them. And so we go through a recognition process once every five years. Uh, and we have to submit a proposal uh, you know, showing that, kind of like the compliance certification that the institutions do, showing that we're doing these things, the department makes a decision uh, as to whether we're living up to that or not. They then make a recommendation to a, um, an advisory council to the uh, Secretary of Education that's colloquially referred to as NASIKI. It is the uh, National Advisory Committee on Integrity and Quality Improvement. I think that's what it's called. Uh, that's why we call them the CQ, we can never remember all those things. But anyway, they are appointed by Congress and the administration, and they make a recommendation on the status of accreditors. Uh, the goal is for both the department and the CQ to suggest that we should be re-recognized. Uh, every five years that happens, I'm gonna knock on this for Micah, and say that we have always been recognized since 1955. Now, we have never lost our recognition. I'm not aware of any of the accreditors that has lost that recognition except one. Two years ago, uh, AC, ACICS, which it was an accreditor that accredited some of the for-profit institutions, lost its recognition. The impact of that was every one of the institutions they accredit then could not get federal financial aid. And it was just like on the spur of the moment, just automatic. Once the the, the recommendation went forward and the secretary said, I agree with it, then federal aid stopped. 200 institutions, imagine just your 24 institutions trying to scramble to find financial assistance for, for students, uh, but 200 of them had to do that. Well, ACICS sued the department and they won uh, because the department didn't follow its process. Uh, thank God for due process. Uh, so now they are back in review, their institutions are back uh, eligible to avail themselves uh, for financial aid, but I, d I have vowed for the 15 years I've been there that my 792 institutions will not have to worry about federal financial aid because of something we didn't do. Uh, it, it, it's an interesting process. So far so good? This is, you know, rehash for those, but for the two of you, are you okay? Okay, good. I'm just checking. I'm a former faculty member, so I look for head shakes and, and smiles and stuff. Nobody's ever fallen asleep during this either, so I'm banking on that too. <laughs> when we talk about SAC COC, and I realize that's a, for those of you who've been around a while, that's still tough to roll off your tongue because forever it was SACs who accredited institutions. We had the College Commission, we had the K-12 Commission, we had a Technical College Commission, and each of those commissions had to send their recommendations to the SACS board for them to actually approve uh, the actions. 
Well, about 10 years ago, no longer does the SACS board have anything to do with the accreditation of institutions. Each of the commission's boards now have their own authority. And so we became separately incorporated from the parent company, SACS, and just kept the acronym that we had of SACS COC. Uh, so it is SACS COC that accredits institutions. So you will often hear me when uh, people, I started to tell Sam this morning when he said, when we went through SACS accreditation, I'm going to SACS COC, Sam. Um, it, it makes a difference. But it is our members who rule us. As I said, the presidents of the 792 member institutions uh, you know, run the place. We can't do anything. This past December, uh, we brought forward to the membership an opportunity for what we call a differentiated accreditation process. It's a shorter process uh, for institutions with which we've never had trouble. Our institutions were saying, why do I have to go through all of this, you know, when I've always lived by the rules and I've never had a problem? And so our membership said, fine, let's see if we can't come up with a shorter process. So we have identified that. We couldn't implement it, however, until the membership approved it. Two years ago, we put in a new data management system with the commission. Uh, because I needed the institutions to pay for it, we had to get them to approve it. And so we took to them this new data management system using Salesforce that's going to allow institutions to upload all of their documents. That's the ultimate goal, so no more paper. Uh, the money that they will save in postage and uh, UPS and FedEx costs uh, it should be offset by the $500 a year uh, technology fee that will just be built into the budget formula. So anything major we do, in 17 we took through a new set of uh, standards. I, it was actually a revised, reorganized set of standards, but we couldn't implement them until the membership approved it. So it is the membership who is in charge of this organization. As I said, we are a membership organization. They are represented by a 77 member <coughs> board of trustees. And that board, in the, uh, the membership in December, elects the board at our annual meeting, and they also elect an appeals committee. Anytime we drop an institution from membership because they haven't uh, abided by our standards or they're out of compliance with too many of them, they get to appeal that decision. That is the only decision that is appealable. Because if they go on warning or they go on probation, uh, they are still fully accredited. They haven't lost anything. They've gained negative publicity, but they haven't lost any rights or privileges within the commission. Once we drop them from membership, however, not only do they <clears throat> you know, lose the right to say they're accredited, but they cannot get federal financial aid either. So they have a right to be heard if they don't agree with what the decision is. Uh, those two bodies are elected in December. The board itself then selects a 13-member executive council on which I said Dr. Sims will now uh, serve starting January 1st, it was, yes. Um, and then the other members of the board uh, serve as what we call the CNR committees. Those are the committees that review the actual um, compliance certifications and recommendations from the committees that go out to visit the institutions. And I'll show you that process in a minute. You don't see me anywhere on there. I don't get a vote. I run the process. I don't get a vote. So when people are mad with us, even though I'm the one that gets all the phone calls and all the letters, I don't get a vote in this process. This is a peer review process. It's a membership organization. I ceased being a member when I became president. I used to be a member and I used to vote, but now I have to run the process. So if you look at me anywhere, I would begin under the executive council, and then my staff would fall under that, okay? Uh, David Johnson, who is the provost at North Alabama, is our incoming board chair. So Alabama is well represented uh, in the commission this year. He was uh, vice chair last year, so we're excited about him coming up. When you look at the trustees, as I said, there are 77 of them. Every state has a minimum of four board members. Three of them represent the institutions, and one of them is a public member, someone who has no affiliation with an institution at all, a, a doctor, a lawyer, a plumber, you know, anybody out in the community. And we've had folks from all different walks of life represent uh, the community on our board. We figured that since they inherit what we produce, then they ought to have something to say about what it is that we do. Um, when I first got there 15 years ago, I moved to uh, Georgia in the, uh, from the Northern Virginia area, Northern Virginia, D.C. area, 
And I don't know if you recall or if you paid any attention, but on the license plates in Washington, it says taxation without representation because they don't have an elected official in Congress, but they pay taxes. And we had at the time five international <coughs> institutions, one of whom have been had been accredited with us since 1968, and they had never had a vote on the board because our international institutions, you know, were not in one of the 11 states. So I asked if we could take one of our at-large positions and put those international institutions into their own state, if you will, and let them rotate uh, a member on the board. So now we have an international member uh, on our board as well. The other 32 serve as what we call at-large members. And we uh, distribute them uh, in several ways. One, to make sure we have a gender balance uh, and an ethnicity balance and a public-private school balance. Uh, we also distributed based on the number of institutions in a state. So Texas, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida have more members on the board because they have more institutions uh, in their particular states. Uh, we do public, private, and for-profit institutions, we accredit. Uh, we have everything from associate degrees through law degrees, medical degrees, our institutions you know, cover the gambit. Our board only meets twice a year, once in June and once in December, which is one reason that the process for reaffirmation takes a while. Uh, used to be only president served on the board, and now we have folks from all over the institutions. We had a college librarian on there for a while, which we've never had before. So uh, it is truly a peer review and a board and a peer review, uh, I mean a peer run institution. I mentioned the appeals committee already. Um, our principles have uh, 14 sections to them. The first one is the uh, most basic, and it says that as a member of this commission, I agree to open up my books to you and welcome all kind of feedback from you. And I'm not gonna lie to you, there's no reason to. So it's what we call the um, standard of integrity. We have had institutions, however, that have forgotten they made that promise and we've had to go back and say, hmm, something happened here. Uh, this examples that I will share with you today, by the way, have been made public already, so I'm not giving away any secrets. One of the uh, things that happened with an institution in Florida was that it did what we ask all institutions to do, and that is commiserate with each other. It's a peer review process. Call somebody and say, what did you tell the commission when you were trying to get through reaffirmation? But if you're going to do that and they share a report with you, please change the name of that institution <laughs> before you submit it as part of yours. Yeah. Because it, it raises the question, if you misled us about this, about what else have you misled us? You know, and it just put, I mean, it's just uh, University of North Carolina got hit with an integrity violation. They had a uh, course that they offered that had no teeth in it. There were no requirements. Uh, unfortunately, many athletes were uh, put into that course. 48% of the enrollment were athletes. <coughs> and nobody fessed up that they were doing that. Uh, that's an integrity violation. There's no reason. If this is a, a, a continuous improvement process, there's no reason for you to lie to us about what's going on or to mislead us about what's going on. So there is no information that an institution submits in to demonstrate compliance with integrity. It's one of those things that as the documents are submitted as the committees go out to visit, they get a feel for whether this institution's really, you know, functioning on the up and up with us. So that doesn't happen often, but that's a biggie. That's a core requirement. You've got to be open and honest uh, to get through this process or it's ridiculous for you to be here with us. I am pleased to say I do not recall or have, and I, I think I'm right on that, there's never been an uh, Alabama institution that has been hit with an uh, integrity noncompliance. So I don't expect that's going to happen. Uh, especially with the chair and all these folks from Alabama on board. The second section is mission. Many institutions, community colleges, for example, that are now considering offering baccalaureate degrees. That changes your mission because you're now offering a degree at a more advanced level. So we require the boards to <coughs> annually review the mission of their institutions to make sure <coughs> that they're still doing what it is that they say they're going to do. Okay. Uh, the third... Uh, there are some standards that we have, like you know, who gave you the authority to exist, 
Uh, and usually that's the legislate, legislation that, you know, uh, enabling legislation that created you. We don't need to know that every year. So the basic eligibility criteria are now held for those institutions that are applying for membership with us. Our, our, if you've been accredited, then you don't have to respond to those anymore. Section four is our governing board. We have a separate section on the governing board. We have a separate section on the administration and organization. There are two different sections with two different sets of requirements because there are two different roles that those two groups play. And they are parallel roles, not perpendicular roles. And when start stuff starts getting into each other's lane, then we have to step back and say, do you sure you want to do that? Because it's going to put you out of compliance with what we're talking. Um, when I get into the standards on the governing board, because I'm going to go through them specifically, I'll talk about um, the, the challenges, for example, of um, having elected officials on the board. Uh, Alabama was a good citizen when you all formed. It's all your fault, and the other states have you to thank for that, or blame, depending on how difficult it is, um, because the governor has budget authority, you know, appoints board members and does all this, so why are you going to be on the board as chair? And in Alabama, the governor was the chair of every college board. Well, how does that work? You know, if you've got two institutions coming to you competing and you're the chair of both boards, which one do you pick? It's like asking which is your favorite child? Uh, you probably have one, but you don't dare verbalize that. Not in live in your house, I'm sure. So. It's those kinds of things that make it very difficult. And I, I recognize, because I've been a board member, telling a governor, thank you very much for your input, but you appointed me because of my expertise, so you now need to leave me alone to do my job. Uh, your governor was kind enough to say, I'd like to still be on the board, but I don't need to be chair. I got enough stuff, other stuff to do. And all of the other institutions are following suit with that. So that's why I said last night that uh, Alabama has been very good with their legislation and listening to what we say and, and the conflicts that can be avoided You know, when you look at our standards based on what it is that the state is doing. I just got a letter from South Carolina yesterday. They want to require that um, students have to take um, have to learn, now have to read the Constitution and demonstrate they understand it, have to read the Declaration of Independence, and under, and they want to know, is it all right for the state to mandate that? You know, states mandate college requirements all the time, but we ask them to please consider the experts in curriculum development, i.e. the faculty, before they put too much stuff out there and not just legislate it. Um, Texas uh, legislature mandated that every high school student could take dual enrollment. Dual enrollment was never designed for every high school student to take. It was designed initially for those students who were seniors who had finished all of their K-12 requirements and we didn't want them hitting the streets in the afternoon. So we said, why don't you get started on your college curriculum first, you know, while you're still here. And then we opened it up to juniors who were high achieving students. But for a freshman to take a college level course when they have not met the requirements uh, the prerequisites of a course does a great disservice to that student. And so, uh, you know, there, there are times when the legislature steps up and we have to go, let's think about this before you do that. So I thank you for all your work, uh, and Chancellor, and, and uh, Dr. Bates also was very instrumental in, in getting us to do that. We have a section on faculty, one on institutional planning and effectiveness. Uh, that's the assessment, uh, student achievement, which is a big, uh, area and now the federal government has finally realized they're putting a lot of money into higher ed and they want to know what they're getting for it. So they're requiring institutions to do a better job in getting students to finish. Uh, whether it's finish a course, finish a certificate, or finish a degree, they just want to make sure that they have some skills that they can go out into the workforce and do something productive. We have one on educational program structure to make sure that there are enough general ed requirements, for example. We have one on the policies, procedures, and practices, those contracts that institutions have with outside entities. We have to approve those to make sure that it's a reputable entity with whom they're partnering. We have one on library and learning information, one on academic and student support services, one on finances and physical resources. And then one to demonstrate, especially in those institutions where there are several layers of governance. For example, um, I worked in the Virginia Community College System for 18 years, and there was a state board like you all are, but they had delegated some of their authority to the local college board. 
And so we just need to know who's on first, who's got what authority and what power. So that's what that one uh, is. It also uh, comes into play with our for-profit institutions because there's going to be several layers of governance uh, where they're concerned. So you can see, we look at everything. If you can find something that we don't review, maybe you don't want to let me know because then we'll probably come up with some standards for it. But I don't think you'll find that there's any stone uncovered when we uh, review an institution and how effective it's been. Okay? Still with me? All right. We put in two new principles with this last uh, revision of our principles. One of them, we found that many of our institutions that were getting in trouble with us were getting in trouble because their boards fell asleep at the wheel. They didn't understand about accreditation. They didn't know about the financial responsibilities. They didn't know about all kind of stuff. And so our membership said, you know, we have a requirement that everybody in the institution be evaluated except the board. So we put in a standard that now every board has to evaluate itself. We don't tell you how to do it because there are organizations out there that have a lot of uh, boilerplates that can do that. The association of uh, community college trustees is a good one, the Association of Governing Boards, AGB is another one. So there's lots of different ways that you can slice that. But we just need to know that you do that. And because you are a state board, then your process is going to be uh, identified in the self-studies, if you will, of the compliance certifications of every one of your <coughs> institutions. So they have to be able to defend that and do that. Because unfortunately, we don't accredit systems, we accredit institutions. The other one is, uh, again, because the federal government is concerned about the money it's spending, one of the things uh, when uh, Virginia Fox from North Carolina was chair of the House Education Committee, she said, you know, we ought to uh, take some of the federal financial aid money away from an institution when the students don't pay back their loans. And so I said, you know, I, I have a doctor of philosophy degree, but I didn't major in philosophy, so logic is not necessarily my strong suit, but help me understand how it is that the federal government loans the money. The federal government determines how much money a student can get. Even if a student wins the lottery, an institution cannot make them pay it back. So why are you taking money away from the institutions when they have nothing to do with this? I haven't got an answer to that yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. But what we can do is to educate students on what happens when you borrow money. Because many of our students, no matter how young or old they are coming to school, oftentimes have never had that much money at their, uh, you know, available to them at one time. And they don't understand that you might be able to default on a different kind of loan and file bankruptcy and it's going away. But a federal loan is one that even after you're dead, your family has to pay back that loan. I, and, and students just never think about that kind of thing. And so we now have a requirement that every institution must provide financial literacy for its students. Not just those who are on federal loans, but just to borrow money for, I mean, to open a credit card. Uh, you know, college freshmen are ripe for credit card companies. They send you here, now that you're in college, have a credit card. And students go, great, they don't talk about it, but it's got to be paid back. You know, uh, they think their mom and dad's going to pay it back. At least that's what my son did until I rudely awakened him to the fact that I don't think so. <laughs> that one's got your name on it. You figured it out. So those are the two new standards that we added in the re revision that we just did. Okay? The reaffirmation process itself is a two-year process, and it starts with the leadership team of each institution come into a meeting so we can tell them what's changed since the last time they were there 10 years prior. They go home and their institution puts together responses to the compliance certification. Uh, they send that report in and we have a committee of their peers who review it and they go through it and say, yes, you're in compliance, nope, you're not in compliance, or I can't figure out whether you're in compliance or not. That report is sent back to the college president who has an opportunity to send a focused report, uh, a report focusing on those non-compliance and unsure <coughs> compliance items. Those two documents then go to the committee that's coming to the institution, and part of their responsibility is to make sure that now we're in compliance with everything that, or that they're in compliance with everything that they're doing. They make a recommendation to the CNR committee. Remember those 64 board members that uh, we talked about? Uh, they may have look at it and say, yeah, everything looks okay, or no, there's still some areas here, or these people just are not listening, and so we need to get their attention, and they recommend a sanction for them. 
Their recommendation goes then to the executive committee or the executive council because the committees only see the reports that come to them, but the council sees all of the reports. And for consistency of nothing else, the council is able to say, you know, committee A uh, put this institution on warning and committee B put this institution on, on probation, but it's the same thing. And so we need to be consistent here. So the executive council's recommendation is the one that goes forward to the entire board. And it's not until our board votes that the status of an institution's accreditation is determined. This is the two-year process that I talked about. Because you all have 24 institutions, they're all at, at a different stage at different times. I, I just ask that you be patient with each of the presidents as they struggle through this. Um, we have had, when I first went to the commission, uh, we had 805 member institutions. We now have 792. Most of that is because of mergers. Uh, you know, times are tough, and to keep institutions open when they're small and they could best uh, serve a community if they were a branch campus of a, another institution and you can save administrative costs and, you know, and uh, all kinds of things. And we've had several institutions that have merged. Uh, Georgia alone had 14 or 15 institutions that merged down into seven. So we've become quite good at, I'm not suggesting that you all want to merge any, but we've, we've gotten good at that. Here we go. Now you can wake up. There are three things that we ask the board to do. We ask you to make policy, not carry it out, but decide the direction of, of your institutions. You know, what, what are the policies that you want to, uh, to follow? We ask that you hire, evaluate, and if necessary, fire the CEO. For you, that would be the chancellor. For the presidents, it's usually the chancellor who makes these decisions. Although oftentimes the chancellor will bring the decision, especially the one to terminate a presidency, to the state board. Uh, but in institutions where it's not a state board, just a local board, they're the ones who, who make that determination. And then the third thing is to have the fiduciary responsibility of the institution. Make sure that there's enough money to keep the doors open. Those are the only three things we ask of you. There are a lot of other responsibilities you might have, but these are the three for which we hold you responsible. Now, there's some pieces that impact each of these. Uh, the first one is one that suggests that you, first of all, have to have the authority to, to do your job. That's usually in the enabling legislation. You have to exercise fiduciary responsibility over the budget. You have to ensure that the chair and the majority of the board are free from conflict. Uh, these include things like, if you're the president of the, or the chairman of the board, you cannot have a relative who works at the institution <coughs> because it begins into question, or brings into question any decision you make may be made on behalf of whoever it is in your family who works there. So we've had board chairs who have had to step down from the chairmanship, uh, can stay on the board, but can't be chair just because of that perceived conflict. We suggest that board members should not um, be given contracts to do work within the institutions unless it's a closed bid process because otherwise it's, there's a perceived conflict that the only reason you got that contract was because you're on the board. And we just want to keep the institution free from that kind of perception. We like to keep you free from it too, but our institutions are the ones that we're more concerned about that you demonstrate that you're not controlled by a minority of board members, so that you don't have three people who are always running everything, uh, that it is indeed a board process, not a little group process. Um, I worked in San Antonio, at San Antonio College. As a matter of fact, I said, I'm probably the only person in the world that started their career at SAC and will end it at SACS. Uh, but San Antonio College was part of the Alamo Community College District. They had a seven-member board three white, three Hispanic, and one black. And everything that was voted on was a 4-3 board split. Everything. They stayed in trouble with the commission until we got them to understand that you're going to have to do a better job of compromising with the other side. Uh, you know, not just the one swing vote that was in the middle, because it is a board decision. No single board member has any more authority than any other board member, not even the chair because your authority comes as a board, not as an individual on that board. And that's a, that's a tough one to help some people understand. 
Um, and then this one says that the CEO is not the presiding officer of the institution board. We also suggest that the board president, or in this case, I mean the, the college president, in this case the chancellor, would not be a member of the board. If the board's role is to hire, evaluate, and if necessary, fire the CEO, that's like putting your child you know, on the same level with you. And I wish Reggie would try to tell me what I could do <laughs> some days, you know? So it just, it's cleaner if the chancellor is the chancellor, or the president's the president, and then the board is the board, okay? So that's one set of criteria. Another one says that you review the mission regularly. I mentioned that a minute ago, especially uh, institutions that are going from single gender to both genders, you know, are, are obviously gonna have a mission change or the other way around. Uh, community colleges now that are uh, adding uh, baccalaureate degrees. We have senior institutions that are adding a uh, associate degrees. That's a mission change as well. So it goes in both directions. Um, we ask that you have a policy as well as your own behavior that says that you know the difference between governing and administering an institution. This is one that tends to get uh, institutions in trouble sometimes when board members start telling the CEO how to do things and, you know, you're, for us, the board's job is to tell the chancellor, this is what needs to be done, but to let the chancellor decide how to do it. And if the chancellor brings you a plan and you don't like the plan, then you turn down the plan and say, go back to the drawing board and come up with something else. You don't sit there and try to come up with a plan. That's that difference I told you between governance and administration. Um, some of our institutions televise their board meetings. It is better than um, reality TV sometimes uh, because you see the real people coming out, you know, saying, well, what about, you, you, should, you didn't do this for my institution. Well, you don't have an institution. Once you get appointed to the board, you have 24 institutions. And that's tough sometimes because you want to be able to, you know, make sure that the folks in, in your district, uh, you know, are well represented. But you have to remember that it's going to be a trade-off. You know, uh, Ms. Baker's district may get something this board meeting when uh, uh, Mr. McAnally's might get something the next board meeting. You, you've got to make sure that everybody gets a piece of what's going on. When that doesn't happen, then unfortunately, it's going to hit the media. And that's going to be one of the ways that I get to come back in a not so friendly capacity, uh, finding out what are y'all doing now. We have one that says uh, that you regularly evaluate the CEO. We have had presidents in the past that have been there 10, 15 years, have never been evaluated by their board. Uh, you don't know whether you have a good CEO or not if you never evaluate them. And it's unfair because we've also had presidents who have been dismissed that were never evaluated. They never knew that there was something wrong. Nobody bothered to tell them. They just said, well, we've decided we want to go in a different direction. If I hear that phrase one more time from a board. Uh, you know, you need to tell them because you've ruined somebody's career by just saying go because nobody's going to be willing to take a chance on them if they don't know what the issue was in the first place. And so y y part of your role is to evaluate. Remember, hire, evaluate and if necessary, fire the CEO, not hire and then fire. There is a middle process there uh, that we ask you to engage in. Uh, this one says that uh, the board uh, addresses conflicts of interest. The state of Alabama may indeed have a conflict of interest policy uh, for appointees. If they do, you all need to adopt that as yours. Let me tell you why that becomes important. I have, uh, I will not be able to retire in the southern region because I will have angered every governor that we have somewhere along the line. Uh, this one is the governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. There apparently was a state statute that allowed the governor to disband boards if it was not representative of the people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. But it had never been used in a college and university before. It was used, you know, in a museum board or community service board. But he decided that the University of Louisville's board, he didn't like that board, so he disbanded the board. Every board has to have a set of bylaws. And in those bylaws, you have a process that talks about how you will terminate a board member's term and for what reasons. And that statute was not in their bylaws. And so for us, for the governor to step in and say that, that was undue political influence, okay? He's not on that board, 
So he's stepping from outside, coming in, telling the board, you know, that they had to go. Well, this governor, this is the immediate past governor, he, he didn't like that. So he made a YouTube video to tell his constituents that I don't work for the accreditor, I work for you, the people who elected me. Fortunately, the chair of the Senate Education Committee didn't like the fact that the governor had that much authority and they got the law changed. Uh, and it was funny because on the day of the election when he lost, I said to myself, if you had worked for the government, for the accrediting body, you might have gotten reelected, but nonetheless. So those kinds of things are important. You have to have that conflict of interest policy and you, you have to live with that conflict of policy. Now, there'll be times when you'll vote and you'll have a conflict and you have to declare that you have a conflict in that particular situation. But you, you've got to do that because it protects the institution from people going around saying, boy, that's a bunch of crooks over there. They just take care of themselves. They're not worried about the institution. And we don't want that to happen. There is one that says that uh, you, that's the one that you have the process uh, of how you're going to terminate board members and for what reasons. Again, if the state of Alabama has that process, then you're going to have to adopt that process as yours. Because when the teams come in, they're going to want to see your policies. They're not going to go read state statute. They want to see your policy. Here's one that says that you protect the institution from undue political influence. This was what I alluded to earlier when I said, you know, telling governors, thank you very much, uh, you know, for, for sharing your opinion, but I'm on this board and you put me here because of my expertise, and I may not be able to do what you want me to do. This is the one that has gotten me uh, front and center, there's a good phrase, in front of boards and, and governors wonder, who is that woman? Um, in Georgia, for example, Georgia Tech is the engineering school in the state. Everybody knows that, except the University of Georgia has a handful of engineering programs because they're not in Atlanta, they're outside of Atlanta, and they wanted access. Well, they came forward to the board asking for additional uh, opportunities for their students in engineering. Well, the then president of Georgia Tech went ballistic, saying, that's, no, 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 that's, that's us. So he went to the governor and said, could you stop this? Well, the governor called every board member and said, I don't want this to happen. Except the board chair didn't particularly appreciate the governor calling, so he called me and said, can the governor do this? I said, governor can do whatever he wants. That's his institution. But you will get in trouble with us if you do that because you're the ones who are governing the system, not the governor. Uh, they voted, and it passed nine to eight, to give uh, Georgia the engineering courses. Uh, never heard from the governor, but he wasn't real happy. Recently, um, University of South Carolina has a new president, and they had a presidential search. The governor is a member of that board, and he, however, had put somebody in to sit in his chair as the official governor's representative. So he was no longer on the board as far as we were concerned because he had appointed somebody. But then when they were selecting the president, he decides to call every board member and tell them who he wants uh, for a president. Well, again, that's undue political influence as far as me. If he had stayed on the board, it wouldn't have been an issue because it would have been a board member talking to another board member. But because he stepped off the board and put somebody else in, it became undue political influence. So our board had to deal with that this past December. Um, and they're asking for additional information. So there's a committee that's going to go down to Columbia to try to figure out what's going on, and it'll come back to the June agenda. So those are the kinds of things that get us to come back and why we ask you to live by those rules so we don't have to come back in that capacity. Here's the one that says that uh, you regularly evaluate your own responsibilities and, and what it is that you do. This is the one that talks about um, that standard 14 that says who's got what governing authority. In Virginia, as I mentioned in the community college system, the presidents were appointed by the state board, but the interview process was conducted by the local board. The state budget was disseminated to the colleges from the state board, but the local boards manage those budgets. So that's the kind of thing we need to know. If you've got that kind of distribution of authority, how does it work? And that's what this particular one refers to. Those are our requirements. These are the things that we also suggest boards need to uh, uh, familiarize themselves with and be concerned about because they impact the effective running of an institution. 
Uh, what kind of long-range planning or strategic planning are you doing? Do you assess what it is that you're doing and how well you're doing it and what kind of changes do you make because of that assessment data? That's stuff that you need to ask each of the presidents or the chancellor does regularly and he can then give you a report for it. Um, if you're still doing developmental education or remedial education, what's the impact of that on your budget? What's the impact of that on enrollment? Are those students moving forward? Many states around the country have done away with developmental ed or remedial ed and they're incorporating reviews into that first uh, introductory math course, for example, uh, or providing opportunities in the learning labs outside of the class uh, so that the students won't have to spend you know, four courses trying to catch up with something that may not need four courses. Um, what, is, what is our completion rate? What does our graduation rate look like? If indeed your purpose is to get students credentialed so they can get out in the world of work, you know, how does that look? What, what is it that we're doing? I have institutions that are senior institutions that have a 5% completion rate. That's totally uh, unacceptable, totally unacceptable. And the federal government is trying to decide, do they hold the institutions accountable or do they hold the accreditors accountable when those rates are low? So what we did, for each institution, they have identified a, a minimum graduation rate, as it were. Uh, I don't feel comfortable establishing a minimum graduation rate that all institutions have to meet because my institutions are too different. Uh, even all my community colleges are different. If some of your institutions may have a 60% graduation rate or completion rate, and others may have a 20%, even though they're all community colleges. But what we've done is to take where the institution is right now. We ask them to identify either their iPads data or their National Student Clearinghouse data, pick one, and that's the baseline for each institution. And we're gonna see them move forward from their own baseline. Uh, so each of your institutions has one of those targets. Um, it's cheaper to keep a student than it is to recruit a new one. Uh, it's better PR to keep a student than it is to recruit a new one. I was pleased to hear, I don't remember if it was Pat or Kenneth, he had a 67% retention rate or something. Yeah, it was a trend. I stand corrected, thank you very much. Um, you know, that's important because that says that the students have, are comfortable with what you're doing, they have faith that you're uh, preparing them for the future and they're willing to stay there to, to get through it. Um, how often do you review your programs? Many times programs stay on the books because the faculty member who developed that program are still there teaching it. Now that's not necessarily reason enough to do that. Sweetbriar College uh, threatened to close. Their board voted to close them a few years ago. And the alumni went crazy because the board just made that decision, which of course the board could, but they didn't consult anybody. Uh, they fought it and kept the institution open. But one of their uh, hallmark programs was an equestrian program. Well, when Sweetbriar first opened, side saddle riding was what they were teaching. And I told them, I said, if you're still teaching side saddle riding in 2017, you know, you, you have not reviewed this program because I don't know of anybody anywhere that's still looking for side saddle riders. Uh, you need to upgrade and update that equestrian program. Many times it sounds ridiculous, but our, our general ed courses have not been updated. Uh, you know, we've not put in our, in our technical programs, they're still teaching, you know, for old equipment rather than for current equipment. You need to review those programs, have those institutions review those programs regularly. At least every five years, uh, every program should go through a program review. Uh, transfer of credit is still a big issue. This is one of the um, rationales that the department gave for getting rid of national and regional accreditors because they said that they were getting too many complaints that students who went to nationally accredited institutions were having difficulty getting their credits accepted at regionally accredited institutions. And I tried to explain to them that I have institutions we accredit that don't accept each other's credits. Um, in Virginia, we were uh, 23 institutions governed by one governing board and we didn't accept each other's credits sometimes. That's the dumbest thing in the universe. It has nothing to do with nationally or regionally accredited. It has to do with institutional choice because it's faculty and institutions that determine what credit they're going to accept. Florida is probably the poster child of best handling that because every institution in Florida, two year and four year, has the same course numbering system. So that when an institution starts at a community college and they transfer to a senior institution, that credit comes over doesn't matter where they took it. Uh, and then the, uh, yeah, there's the last one. 
So you have a tough job. I thank you for doing it uh, so well. Uh, you all really are a great example of how working together a system can continue to move forward. And I, I would love to pack you up and take you with me every time I have to go do this presentation. Uh, but I do reference you often. I'd love to give you that. So any questions? Weaver and I, I just have a comment. I still have in my files the letter that you wrote recommending this new governance for this community college system. So thank you for your vision. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, we appreciate your guidance in, in these, all these different areas. Uh, Any Did I say the same thing this time I did last time? No, ma'am. Uh oh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's better. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've been here longer, and now, yeah, I understand. And for the two of them, they'll help them out, they'll get there. Mm -hmm. enough to remind me too that I forgot to mention that Jackie Screws was a new member of our board. This board just came on board in January and I've been on vacation so I apologize. <laughs> well Mr. Chairman thank you. Mr. Chancellor thank you for the invitation and thank you again for the work that you all do. I, I am uh, appreciative of it uh, on behalf of all the students that you serve.